if you have text and you want to get it into a machine learning pipeline, then you'll need to apply some sort of a featureizer such that it has a numeric representation. And by and large, there are two types of features that you might be able to generate. There are dense features, and there are sparse features. Dense features are characterized by having a floating point number representation inside of it, and very typically these are generated by something of a word embedding. And a sparse representation is different. A sparse representation is an array that mainly contains zeros, but in certain places might have an integer value. Typically, the main featureizer that comes to mind here is something called the count vectors featureizer. And so far in this playlist, I've been emphasizing these word embeddings. And not without reason. Word embeddings have been pushing the state of the art forward. But one thing I would hope to make clear in this video is that if you were to then start to ignore these count vectors, well, then you would be doing yourself a disservice because these count vectors are definitely still relevant, especially if you're building a digital assistant. So in this video, I would like to discuss what the count vector featureizer might be able to do for you. And I would also like to demonstrate a use case where we're able to show that word embeddings might be having a bit of trouble where count vectors are actually performing quite well. Before we get there though, let's just show you what these count vectors are and what they do. What I have in front of me here is a Jupyter notebook where I'm using the count vectorizer from scikit-learn. In the feature extraction.txt submodule, you'll find this one. And what I'm doing is I'm giving it some text, uh, good pizza, good tacos, good coffee. And let's say that these are all examples of utterances. And what's happening in this line of code is the count vectorizer is picking up all of these examples and in doing so, it's learning how to represent text that might come next numerically. So let's have a look at what that might look like. What I can do is I can call the transform method inside of that count vectorizer, and I can give it the word pizza, and we can have a look at what comes out. And what comes out is a sparse matrix. In general, what comes out over here, this object is going to be an object that has more zeros than ones. So, Memory-wise, it is more efficient to give it a sparse representation, but for our intents and purposes, I'm just going to take that sparse array and make it a normal NumPy array, and that way we can have a look at what's happening. For starters, this array over here has four elements, and that corresponds to the four different words that we see here. We have coffee, we have tacos, we have pizza, and we have the word good. So that means that the count vectorizer will have a vocabulary of four tokens, and it seems that pizza over here, that is the third token. If you want to confirm that in the notebook, what you can do is you can just call the vocabulary underscore property, and then you can see a dictionary which will tell you how everything is encoded. And from just glancing at this, the encoding seems to be alphabetic. Coffee that starts with a C is at index zero. Next is good at index one, then pizza, and then taco. So this gives us a base impression of what the count vectorizer will do for us. For every single token, good, pizza, tacos, and coffee, we are going to get a one if it's in the text, and we're going to get a zero if it isn't. And we can also do that for the word tacos, for example. And what we see now here is that this row corresponds with this index over here. So that makes sense. But what I can now also do is I could add the word good here as well. And by doing this, we don't just get the correspondence from the tacos token in the array, but we also get the good token represented. So I hope with this example, it's relatively clear what this count vectorizer will do from the get-go. There are some extra things that happen under the hood though. For example, notice what happens if I change this pizza into a pizza with a capital letter. Technically, this should be a different token because pizza with a capital does not appear in our vocabulary. Yet when I run this, 
the result is exactly the same. And the reason for that is that this count vectorizer has some parameters that have default settings. In particular, lowercase is set to true, meaning that all the text will be lowercased before being handled. And that's not the only setting that we have at our disposal. There's actually quite a few of these settings that we can go ahead and use. There is also a strip accents function, for example, which in English is not per se super useful, but it definitely is useful in many European languages. So I'm going to set the strip accents feature to ASCII, retrain this count vectorizer, and next what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of saying good tacos, I'm going to say tacos with the uh vowel. And again, if I were to run this now, it is still the same representation. If I were to remove the strip accents now though, pay close attention to this number over here, that is now a zero. And this is where word embeddings may fall a bit short. Now it does depend on what sort of embedding you're using, but for a lot of word embeddings, if there's a slightly different spelling, it is a different word and most of the time it will be encoded differently. So I hope that this example already paints a picture that this count vectorizer, given the right settings, can handle some use cases for us that we are actually interested in. I've moved everything back to the basic setting, so no extra parameters for now, and I've removed the special characters from here. What I briefly want to show you is that the count vectorizer also comes with a maximum document frequency as well as a minimum document frequency parameter. What this allows you to do is tell the count vectorizer when to ignore tokens. With the max document frequency set to two, I'm gonna remove all the tokens that appear in more than two documents. Every text that we add to the dot fit command is a separate document and that's how the counting occurs. In this particular case, because the word good appears three times in all of our texts, that means that the token good should be the one that gets removed. Let's run this to see what happens. And we can see the effect. Now, this can be a really useful parameter if you're concerned about stop words. And the minimum document frequency can be a nice way to filter out words that only happen once or twice. If you are really concerned about stop words though, it is also valid to mention that we have a stop words parameter at our disposal, such that we can give it a list of words that it can just go ahead and ignore. Let's now discuss two parameters of this count vectorizer that are very relevant for the creation of chatbots. One thing that I can do is I can specify the n-gram range. And this allows me to not just featureize single tokens, but to also featureize a sequence of, in this case, two tokens. If I were to run this now, we should see that extra features get created. And we see over here that it's not just good and pizza that got featureized, but also good pizza together. Because again, we are tokenizing with an n-gram equal to two. And I can tokenize with an m-gram that's even larger. That's a setting that I can tweak here. But this can be useful if you're dealing with very large texts. In a chatbot setting, however, we're usually not dealing with very large texts. We're dealing with really short ones. But one thing that we can do to make this n-gram setting very useful to us is to also pass a different analyzer to the count vectorizer. What that allows us to set is that we don't want to generate these n-grams on separate words, but on characters. And if I were to run this now, we are generating way more features. And that's because we're doing the same thing as before, but now we're looking at all the different characters. So here we see good being split up into three segments of two characters. And the same thing is happening here with pizza, as well as tacos and coffee. And we can go a step further by also doing not just bigrams, but trigrams. And now you can also see that we have sequences of three letters appear here. So you might look at these features and wonder, well, why are these so interesting for digital assistants? Well, they are very interesting because they allow us to capture spelling errors. 
To demonstrate this, I'm just going to go ahead and do a misspelling of pizza by adding an extra Z. Well, if I were to compare these two arrays, I actually get quite a bit of overlap because double Z is also encoded below as well as above, as well as ZA, etc. And this allows us to just capture a little bit of information on how the word is spelled. And that in the end is something that's quite useful in a chatbot setting because misspellings happen all over the place. And I figured to wrap up this video, what might be interesting is to just compare the similarity that we see here with the similarity that we might see if we were using word embeddings. So what I have now done is I am using the what lies package that we've open sourced a while ago, such that I can load in the English core web medium spacey language. This object comes with embeddings. And what I can do is I can ask it to retrieve the most similar embeddings to pizza. And what you can see here is that definitely uh, pizza, pizzas, those are similar. Things like topics and breadsticks. And these things all in all, are about food, a bit on the fast food spectrum. So I would argue that these are indeed sensible candidates, but then let's see what happens if I do the same thing, but I'm misspelling pizzas by adding an extra Z and by adding an S here. Now I would argue that byproducts, rhinos and LCDs have very little to do with a pizza. So we might ask ourselves the question, what exactly is happening here? And the answer can be found by looking at the vector for this token. If you look at this vector, you'll see that it just contains zeros. And I would argue that that's also a sensible fallback scenario. You're saying that this token contains no embedded information. And for a token that's unknown, I do think that's a reasonable way of dealing with it. However, if a user is misspelling something in production, we would like to be able to associate it with something that we've seen in the training set. And as we can see here, this language model with the embeddings from Spacey, they are very useful, but they're falling short in this use case. And since misspellings are so frequent in the chatbot setting, it is actually really common to still see count vectorizers being used. And it's not just for word tokens, it's for characters as well. And this is the reason. Word embeddings are definitely still very useful to have and they can help quite a bit. But if you wanna have a lightweight insurance policy against misspellings in your digital assistant, then having a count vectorizer is the first thing that you should try. And in our experience, the count vectorizer usually makes it to production simply because of this reason. Now inside of Raza, we make use of the scikit-learn count vectorizer. That's what we're using under the hood. But we're also adding a couple of extra parameters. And I should also mention that there are some word embeddings that are somewhat robust against spelling errors as well. I will discuss these topics in new videos for this playlist. So I hope you're interested in these topics and that you'll stay tuned for those.